This is Pete Quayarello. I'm a consultant with Accelerez, and with me is Nick Totillo. Hi, guys. This is Nick Totillo. As Dave said, we're going to talk about uh, automating System Center Service Manager with Orchestrator. What we're going to talk about, we're going to start by talking about the kind of automation that you can do natively in Service Manager, uh, focusing on notification and workflow. And then what we're going to do from there is we're going to look at some use cases uh, that you can uh, you can do with Orchestrator and Service Manager. And then we're going to summarize it all at the end. We'll give you some considerations and some conclusions, and then we'll, uh, we'll do some Q&A at the end. So with that, let's jump in and let's talk for, for anybody who's not aware, we'll just talk a little bit about what Orchestrator is. So Nick, why don't you talk a little bit about Orchestrator? Sure. So yeah, Orchestrator is one of the uh, components of the Microsoft System Center suite. Um, and it's a run book automation tool. So it's going to allow you to build workflows that will automate discrete IT tasks. Um, it's a little bit different than the rest of the System Center components in that it's it's really a development tool more comparable to Visual Studio than, say, Operations Manager or Service Manager. Um, but what makes Orchestrator unique in that regard is that it's administrator-oriented. It's really focused on allowing non-developers um, and enabling non-developers to create these workflows and to implement and, and maintain them um, over a period of time. It's highly scalable, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit later about how we, how important that is, and how, uh, in particular, it's it's easy to get started with Orchestrator from uh, sort of the ground up to start with very simple run books, very simple workflow, and allow that to sort of evolve over time and become more complex as your understanding of Orchestrator becomes more complex, and it can of course scale to very large, complex, uh, automated environments. Um, and it's also uh, very easily integrated with other tools. Um, Service Manager, the rest of the System Center suite, uh, it's very easily integrated with those, as well as other Microsoft products and applications like Active Directory and SharePoint, and even third-party tools like uh, VMware or HP Service Desk. So the integration between Orchestrator and other tools is made quite easy. All right, great. So let's now talk about Orchestrator and Service Manager. And we get this question a lot uh, on the left. Is Orchestrator essential for Service Manager? We've had a few clients uh, approach us and say, well, our understanding is that if we're going to do Service Manager, we need to do Orchestrator. And uh, the answer is, as you can see, no. You, you don't need Orchestrator to do Service Manager. You have native notification and workflow capability in Service Manager, and it's pretty good, and, and we'll go into a little bit of detail on that uh, in another uh, slide or two. Um, but there are some reasons why you might want to complement Service Manager with Orchestrator. So again, Nick, why don't you give us some ideas about why Orchestrator and Service Manager work well together? Sure. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, Orchestrator has a very small footprint in terms of its server resources. It's a single server. Um, the server itself can be quite small, a couple gigs of memory, a single processor, and, and you can really get started with it. So it's it's very easy to sort of deploy it to an environment and get started with looking at it. Uh, in a lot of ways, it really rounds out Service Manager's native workflow capability. We're going to talk about that really during the bulk of this presentation and talk about how Orchestrator really can complement Service Manager in a lot of different ways. Um, and because there's so many sort of low-hanging fruit in terms of the um, gaps that Orchestrator can fill, uh, using it to, to supplement Service Manager is a great introduction. Uh, it's an excuse to get Orchestrator into an environment. Some of the use cases that we're going to talk about are great um, both because they're useful, but they're also great um, knowledge transfer tools. They're a great way of learning how Service Manager and Orchestrator can integrate. And they're great um, at teaching you how Orchestrator can can handle different automation requirements. So I, I think that these are a lot of good use cases, and there are a lot of things that, that we'll often introduce into an environment as a way of, of teaching folks about how Orchestrator works.
All right, great. So let's now start to get into some of the details here. Uh, and just to, just to, to set expectations, we are going to go through um, some details, uh, a few different examples. Uh, we'll try to leave some time at the end for, for questions. So if you could hold questions to the end, that would be great. Um, what can we do natively in Service Manager? And, 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 and natively is, is we're actually going to talk about some stuff that you can do with a little bit of light customization. So this isn't just what you can do natively, but we've talked a couple of times in the presentation so far about these two types of automation, notification and workflow. Um, so Nick, tell us about what we can do natively or with light customization with each one of these things. And then also talk about some of the things that we can't do that we get uh, that our clients often want to be able to do. Sure. So yeah, I'll be brief here, guys, because we do want to get into uh, what how orchestrators may help fill these gaps. And, and many of you are probably already familiar with um, Service Manager's native functionality. So within notification, um, it's an SMTP-based notification, and we'll use an existing SMTP server, and we can trigger emails. Uh, based on two different things. Right within the console, we can create event-based or periodic notifications. So when uh, certain criteria are met, like an incident gets created or an incident is resolved or a change request is ready for approval, we can use those events to trigger an email to somebody. Um, when we're sending those emails, those are based on an email template, which can either be an HTML or plain text, and we can insert substitution strings into those things, like allowing us to insert the title of the incident or the ID or status of a service request, something like that. Um, when we talk about the recipients of those emails, it can be two kinds of recipients. We can either add what we call a related recipient, which would be like the user assigned to an incident or the approver on a change request, something that's dynamic. Or we can send it to a named recipient, something that'll be the same each time. Uh, a common example of this is a priority one incident notification. Maybe we want to email uh, a distribution list every time a priority one incident gets created. So those are named recipients. They don't change every time. They're, they're kind of static. We can also do relationship-based notifications. These are done with a custom management pack, but, but they're done right within Service Manager. They don't require any, uh, any tools outside of Service Manager. And that would allow us to send an email when a relationship gets created, like when an incident is assigned to a user, for instance. Some of the gaps that we have, though, um, with those relationship-based notifications is additional filtering. If we're going to trigger an email notification when it, an incident gets assigned to a user, we can't also say, but only when the incident is a certain priority or only if it's assigned to a specific support group. So we're limited in how we can do that kind of filtering. We're also limited in the kinds of details that we can add to the email templates that get sent out. We only have access to, to so many things inside of the uh, Service Manager database when creating those templates, which is almost never an issue, but occasionally uh, it becomes a problem. Like when we want to send email notifications to uh, users to uh, approve a change request or a service request, it can be very difficult to get enough relevant information into those email templates. Um, there's performance, uh, while periodic notifications are definitely available to you inside of Service Manager, they do impact the performance of the application a bit, and you have to be mindful of that. So if you're going to have lots of periodic notifications, you have to size the infrastructure appropriately. We'll talk later about how Orchestrator can help uh, reduce that need. And, and status monitoring. It's Service man Manager is not a workflow uh, management tool. So its uh, interface and the monitoring the status of workflows is limited. Moving on down to workflow then, it's really a lot of uh, same things. Notification is actually just a special kind of workflow in Service Manager. Um, sending an email is just one thing we can do. We can also edit uh, data in a template. Or again, with the custom management pack, we could embed a .NET script like a PowerShell script. These are still going to get triggered the same way notifications get triggered. They're either event-based or they're relationship-based. And we have a lot of the same kinds of gaps. Um, we can't do filtering if we're going to do relationship-based. Um, you can't remove data values when you're applying a template in a workflow. You can only change or add data. And there is no built-in periodic workflow capability. Um, one of the biggest gaps that we see here with workflow is there's, there's no logic-based workflow capability. 
we can't say, for instance, when a service request gets created, if the category is X, do this. If the category is Y, do that. What that would have to be in native service manager terms is, is two separate workflows. So that's just some of the, the, the things that we can do with notification and workflow and some of the gaps that we're going to talk about now in the next three slides that, that we can fill with, with Orchestrator. And if I could just uh, real quickly uh, ask everybody to, to mute, uh, and then you can take yourself off mute at the very end if, you, if you've got questions. We would appreciate that. Thanks, so, Pete. In terms of, um, of notifications, so if we focus on notification, we got a couple of use cases here uh, that, that come up pretty regularly. And what we wanted to do was talk through what we can do with Service Manager alone and then uh, what more we could do if we used Orchestrator. The first uh, is uh, a basic SLO notification. A lot of our clients want that. Uh, for example, if an SLO goes to warning or if it breaches, uh, they want somebody to get an email. It might be uh, whoever is assigned or it might be, say, a supervisor or manager. Um, and we can do that with service manager with some limitations. And then we've got the uh, relationship notification. The example we've used here is uh, an incident assigned to a user. Um, that's something that we can do in service manager. Um, but again, with some limitations. So, Nick, why don't you maybe expand a little bit on these and then talk about what more we can do with Orchestrator. Sure. So, yeah, the two examples we've got here for, for notification, as Pete said, are SLO notifications and then the relationship-based notification, like we mentioned before, assigning an incident to a user. If we use Orchestrator for the SLO notifications, in addition to triggering on a status change, like when an SLO goes to warning or breach, we can also filter on any other work item property. Like, for instance, we could only send these email notifications when uh, an incident is of a certain priority. Uh, or we could only send these email notifications when um, they have a certain category or are assigned to a certain group. We can also introduce logic into these. So we can say, for instance, if they're priority one incidents, we want to send that SLO warning and breach to a certain group. If they're priority two or three incidents, we can send it to a different group. So we've got a lot more flexibility in terms of when these emails trigger and then where they go. We can also include more data in the email. Like we mentioned on the previous slide, there are some limitations in the kinds of data that you include in a service manager email template. And we don't have any limitations like that in Orchestrator. We can put anything in the CMDB into that email. Um, similarly, with the relationship notifications, the primary advantage you get with using Orchestrator here is the ability to filter on those work item properties. Like I mentioned before, if you're going to have a relationship-based notification that triggers when an incident is assigned to a user, we can't further um, filter that and say, I want to send this when an incident is assigned to a user, but only if it's also assigned to a support group or only if it's not assigned to a support group. And we've got the flexibility to do that within Orchestrator. We can filter on, on any creation or deletion of a relationship, and in addition to that, filter on any properties of, of either that incident or that user. And again, we can also include more data in that email. Um, one of the other gaps with relationship-based notifications is there is no periodic relationship-based notification. They're all event-based, so the email will get triggered when the relationship is created, and that's it. In Service Manager, or with Orchestrator, rather, we can we can introduce a periodic notification or a repeat notification. So, for instance, you know, we can send an email a couple of times to the assigned to user until they do something like respond to the incident, something like that. Um, and the other thing I, I mentioned this previously, again, we can set dynamic recipients. So, depending on the status of the incident, the SLO status of the incident, on some piece of criteria, we could decide whether we're just going to email the assigned user. Or maybe we could email the assigned user and uh, a supervisor or something if this is a priority one and it needs to get jumped on quickly. Okay, so let's now talk about workflow. Uh, and again, same idea. We've got a couple of use cases here that we see from time to time. Um, and we'll talk about what we can do with Service Manager alone and then what more we can do with Orchestrator. So the first example is assigning uh, an email-based incident based on a keyword. So let's say we've got a, a certain keyword in the subject or description. Uh, we can configure Service Manager to look for that 
and then basically apply a template to it that might then route it to a specific support group or a specific analyst. Uh, the second use case we have, this is not something we can do natively, but it's something that we often do with uh, a custom PowerShell script, and that is to automatically resolve uh, pending incidents. Say an incident's been in a pending status for a certain period of time. We've got a couple of customers who have policies that say, basically, if something's been on hold for a certain amount of time, we're just going to automatically resolve it. Um, so again, we can do both of these in, in the uh, first case natively, in the second case with PowerShell. But as we saw with notifications, we do have some limitations, and this is where Orchestrator gives us some flexibility. So again, Nick, why don't you expand? Sure. So in our, our first use case here, um, the first thing that Orchestrator is going to uh, improve on what Service Manager can do here is that we can have a single runbook with logic in it that can handle all of the different keywords that you might want to have. In Service Manager, you need to have a separate workflow for each keyword. And there's a couple of issues with that. Uh, one is that it's a little bit more difficult to manage than a single workflow. And the second is that it's a bigger performance hit on the server since these are all workflows that will always be running and monitoring for these incidents to get created. So we can really decrease the footprint of that workflow by moving it into Orchestrator. Um, the second thing that we're going to improve on is that um, with a service manager workflow, what we can do is we can apply an incident template. Um, and what that is going to allow you to do is to add or change any data that's on the incident form. With Orchestrator, we can change any data in the CMDB. It doesn't necessarily have to be a field that's exposed on the form, and it also doesn't have to be a field on the incident. We can really go anywhere and change any piece of data. We can also change, add, remove uh, data or relationships as well. So we have a lot more flexibility in terms of what we do with that incident and with the data inside of it. Um, with the auto resolve pending incidents example here, um, Service Manager really gets you pretty far in this case. If you can write some PowerShell, if you're familiar with the Service Manager shell, um, this solution is actually fairly robust. But what Orchestrator will allow us to do is a couple of things. Um, Probably the, the most important point here is that there's no PowerShell needed. All of the workflow that goes into a simple uh, automation like this can be done by dragging and dropping activities in Orchestrator. So it doesn't require any knowledge of PowerShell to get started. Um, we can also uh, filter on additional incident data. So for instance, we could skip incidents that are assigned to VIPs. Um, we could skip incidents that are at a certain priority. So we have, again, more flexibility in terms of filtering the kinds of, uh, the kinds of incidents that come through this workflow to make sure that we're really only resolving incidents that, that we want to resolve per our policy. And the last point here, the easier to monitor status really applies to any orchestrator runbook. Um, all orchestrator does is run workflow. So it's got a lot of, uh, functionality packaged around that workflow engine that's going to allow you to monitor the status of these workflows. And if they do fail, you can get a lot more detail about why they failed. If it was because you had dirty data coming in or out, or it was because the actual workflow was configured improperly. Um, so all of the packaging around the actual workflow engine itself is, is much more robust. All right, so now let's talk about cross-platform automation. And we're, we're, we're kind of uh, going off the map a little bit with this one. Um, you know, frankly, Service Manager is not designed all by itself to do cross-platform automation. So to, to say that there are some gaps here isn't completely fair. Uh, it's not quite the same case as with workflow and with notification. But nonetheless, we feel like it's important to, to cover this. Um, again, if we talk about the examples that we see most frequently, new user creation, this is coming up a lot. We have a lot of customers who are looking, uh, and in particular with uh, the service manager self-service portal, to do like a new hire, uh, new user workflow, to do a request uh, when somebody new comes into the organization, we can, uh, as you can see with Service Manager alone, we can do the approvals, but all of the user creation tasks are going to have to occur outside of 
the application outside of Service Manager. And it's somewhat the same for software deployment. We can capture the request, we can facilitate approvals if they're needed, but the deployment tasks are going to have to occur outside of Service Manager. And again, in fairness, Service Manager wasn't really designed to do all of that sort of automation. But while we're talking about the combination of Service Manager and Orchestrator, we wanted to touch on this just to, to be clear about it. Yeah, so, and, and obviously where Orchestrator is going to fit in here is where, where Service Manager stops, um, where somebody in, in the first example would have to then manually go into Active Directory and, and exchange and, and create accounts and add them to groups and things like that. And that's really where Orchestrator can pick up. Um, one of the things that we call out here is what we sort of like to refer to as it enhanced or advanced approvals in Service Manager. Um, one of the things we can do in Orchestrator that we cannot do in Service Manager, because we've got the ability to, to do logic-based workflows here, uh, is we can we can dynamically set approvers in Service Manager um, based on some criteria. So a new user creation, for instance, we could add the approver after the request gets created based on the new user's department. Um, somebody could manually select who they want to approve a given request in the self-service portal when they're creating the request. And we can have Orchestrator go and make that person a reviewer on a review activity for us. Um, if you guys are familiar with Service Manager, you may know that um, reviewers are set in the template. And without writing, again, some custom PowerShell or something like that, they can't be added. Fact. So that's a pretty key uh, distinction that Orchestrator makes. And then, of course, after that, it's it's the whole IT process automation thing. Orchestrator can create the Active Directory account. It can place them in the right groups, create their Exchange mailbox, enable link. Um, we can integrate with uh, third-party tools like procurement uh, tools or payroll. So, for instance, Orchestrator can integrate with uh, like an Oracle purchase requisition tool to create the purchase recs for software or hardware that might be needed after an approval has been given. Um, so you can build a lot of that, that process automation into Orchestrator. Obviously, that's where it shines. That's where it does its work best. Um, and then the last thing that Orchestrator can do here that's really helpful is it can go back to Service Manager when it's all done and update it with the work that's been carried out. So it can go back to the service request inside of Service Manager or the activities. And it can say, I created this user, I added it to this account, these are the, uh, this is the mailbox that was created for it. So after it does all of its work, it can go back to Service Manager and provide a status report, basically, and say, here's all of the things I did, um, which really helps improve that kind of visibility. Because one of the things when you introduce automation into environment is there's a chance that you start to lose visibility because Orchestrator is going and doing things Um by itself. So we can have it come back to Service Manager and provide that sort of status update. And it's a similar, uh, so along a similar vein with, with software deployment. Um, Service Manager sort of stops at the uh, creation of the request and assignment and, and approvals. Um, and then Orchestrator can pick up. We've got the same ability to do enhanced approvals. So if I'm asking for uh, software that doesn't require a license for some freeware, we can nix the whole approval. If I'm asking for something that requires a license, Orchestrator can ask for approval. It can integrate with a uh, asset management tool to check on whether or not licenses exist before it goes and deploys the software. Um, so again, the whole IT process automation steps in here and can carry out this request in a very hands-off manner. All right, so if we're going to summarize what we just went through. Uh, as we talked about, Service Manager does not require Orchestrator, but you can do a lot of nice stuff with Orchestrator. And what we find is that Service Manager is a good starting point for Orchestrator. In fact, what we're, we're getting into more commonly now are Service Manager projects where Orchestrator kind of piggybacks and where we do some combination of the use cases that we illustrated in the presentation, really more as a proof of concept, um, because th there's often interest in Orchestrator, but no obvious starting point. So what we're seeing more frequently nowadays is an interest in at least uh, getting Orchestrator up in the environment and exploring it a little bit. 
And as I said, those use cases that we illustrated a little bit earlier in the presentation are usually very relevant to, to most of our customers and provide, as I say, a, a good way of helping to understand, understand both what Orchestrator can do and how to make it do those sorts of things. Yeah, and, um, and, and that really leads us into the next two points. Um, and these, these two conclusions are, are really related. Um, certain conditions have to exist in order for something to be automatable. Um, data has to have a certain level of consistency. Um, we need to be able to rely on a user's input. Um, so there either needs to be some data validation or, or training so we know that users are going to input data properly. So, so those conditions really need to exist before we can consider whether or not something is going to be a good fit for Orchestrator. Um, and the reason for that really is covered in the third point there. You know, we approach Service Manager with sort of an implementation methodology that, that's, that's more about configuring a tool to, to meet some um, functional requirements. And, and the process is a bit different with Orchestrator. It's really a development process. Um, identifying requirements accurately, um, creating a specification for the run books that we're going to we're going to build and then really carrying out thorough testing becomes much more important um, in this case because it is a development process. It's like we're building little applications. Um, and testing is especially important in Orchestrator because um, it's it's possible just like if you're building a little application that if you introduce something that's going to interact with very important critical systems like Active Directory or Exchange, you want to make sure that the results of that are going to be highly predictable. Um, so it's important that your your testing um, around Orchestrator is very thorough and, and covers a lot of different use cases and negative testing and everything like that. So, um, so the approach to Orchestrator is a bit different than it is with Service Manager. But like Pete said, they're a really good fit for each other. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of functionality gaps that Orchestrator can fill within Service Manager. Um, and it's a really good introduction into starting to use Orchestrator for more sophisticated, more advanced automation like new user creation or software distribution, VM deployment, things like that. So with that, um, does anybody have any questions? You're, you're welcome to unmute and ask or feel free to use the IM window if that's preferable. See a few people typing. Yeah, let's see. Can Orchestrator, so one, one question for Mark here. Can Orchestrator and SCSM integrate with SharePoint? Um, Orchestrator can integrate with SharePoint, and so by extension, Service Manager can. One of the things that Orchestrator is really good at doing is acting as a hub of data between two different tools. So if you want to integrate Service Manager with SharePoint, one of the one of the ways we've, we've seen this done in the past is with uh, knowledge articles. Maybe you've got your knowledge base in SharePoint already, and you want to create knowledge article records for all of those SharePoint-based articles in Service Manager. And Orchestrator is very good at doing that sort of thing. Uh, there's another question here. It says, curious what you can do with Orchestrator and Hyper-V. Can you do things like upgrade VM tools, uh, run a scriptable VM names off each host, and grab fields like VM additions, creation date? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that I, I know Microsoft is very excited about where, where Orchestrator can shine is in its integration with Virtual Machine Manager and, and Service Manager and how to automate um, the provisioning of VMs, the provisioning of whole services. Um, so I can go onto a request, ask for a couple of VMs, and Orchestrator can go and spin those up for me. It could definitely be used as a, as a method of gathering information like that as well. It can go into Hyper-V, VMM, VMware, most virtualization tools, and gather that kind of, um, that kind of information and either provide a report, uh, or it can actually go and do something like if, I notice 
something's not meeting a certain convention, it could just fix it for you and then tell you how to fix it. So there's a lot of little um, opportunities for things like that. Um, and and you mentioned they're running running a script to build VM names. Um, one of the great things about orchestrators is you often don't have to get into scripting. Um, most of the time, the activities that are available to you um, will negate the need to to have to write your own scripts. But orchestrator can definitely embed scripts um, or or trigger scripts that exist on a server somewhere. Um, so in cases where the activities don't meet your needs, as long as there's some sort of interface, some sort of API into the application you're trying to automate or a database on the back end, you can use scripts or SQL queries to get the data that you need to get. This is Dave. I don't have a question. Uh, there, and there may be additional questions. Uh, go ahead and ask. But uh, we do have a statement. We will be at the Worldwide Partner Conference. So if you'd like to meet Nick, uh, myself, um, uh, Scott, and some others, uh, uh, stop by our booth. It's booth 2000, uh, 2007. I'm just pasting the little link here to it so you can see. So we'd be glad to, to meet you and talk to you and uh, see about your use cases for, for Orchestrator uh, with Service Manager and any other integrations that you're you're looking at with the uh, third-party tools. You know, um, So um, have a look at that. Uh, do let us know if you're coming to WC. We'd love to see you. So, yeah, thank you very much, guys. Thank have you. Have a good one. Thank you.